Hello and welcome to Spotlight's Open House Meet the Director live stream. I'm delighted to be joined today by Paul Andrew Williams who has worked on films such as London to Brighton, The Cottage and more recently uh, the first three series of Broadchurch. Paul, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Hello. Um, incidentally, we will be taking questions from our online audience later on, but um, Paul, how did you start out? I understand that you worked as an actor previously to directing, um, getting into... Directing. Yeah, basically I went to drama school mm -hmm. and sort of left there, did, what did, did all right, did bits of drama, yeah. uh, did, you know, TV, plays, or, you know, did sort of I was a job and actor, you could say. And then um, I had an idea for a short film and I spoke to my friend about it and he was a runner at a production company and he said, oh, well, let's try and do it. And sort of three months later, we filmed it and it was all professional. We were, you know, it was on film at the time, mm. um, you know, with the crew and everything. It was all kind of spec, you know, mad. Mm -mm. And from there, I sort of just got the, you know, maybe this could be a laugh. Yeah. And then started to do music videos and then eventually you know, sort of the short films start to get a bit better and I sort of like working with actors and then from there so sort I of went to America for a bit nothing happened there and then came back and sort of wrote lines of writing yeah. and made that so you did go to excuse me film school how how did you learn about all the technical aspects of um, about the technical yeah, aspects directing and cameras and I don't think I think the thing is, is, I don't think I learned at all. Yeah. I think basically from day one of doing stuff, obviously you have the, your crew and um, I storyboarded everything and said to the DP guy, the DP is not the DP guy, but the, the, <laughs> say, that's, can you make it look like that? Mm -hmm. And that and that and that and that. And sort of over the years, you know, you pick up bits and bobs, but te technically, and not necessarily, I, I wouldn't, you know, people say words and stuff when we're filming and I'm like, dude, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, you know, so it's a more of a natural instinct of hopefully. Sure. And do you think that was because of the whole acting um, experience previously and, and understanding, um, you said you liked working with actors, but understanding, you know, about storytelling? Um, do you know what? I literally, ha it's weird. I don't really have an idea and I sort of think about, you know, I spent a lot of time over the years sort of thinking about what is the method, what method have I got, what is that? Mm. And I honestly think that it's just instinct really, just mm. sort of, I go on meetings, obviously sometimes that really works and sometimes that doesn't work. Um, and sort of get a feeling that if it looks right or if I believe the character and what they're saying and what they're doing, um, then hopefully that will come across on, yeah. on the screen. What what directors did you admire along the way? Who who do you think has been a, a big inspiration <clears throat> to you? Um, it's weird. I think that when I, I originally sort of thought that I wanted to be a director, you know, I thought, sort of, actually, I'd like to do this from after watching Nil by Mouth, I think. Mm. And um, I like so many different types of film and mm -hmm. so many different mm -hmm. types of director. Um, and, but I think that I would never say that I would try and emulate any of them because I sort of don't like looking at, I don't like having references very much. Mm. I don't like, you know, a lot of the time is people, uh, when you're sort of developing things, you're always like, what's what's the comparable, what's whatever? Mm. And I try and think, well, actually, I know I don't want to say there is because it's in my head and I want to try and get that out. Um, obviously, there are so many brilliant directors. I really like David Fincher, but then, mm -hmm. I'm a, <clears throat> you know, I'm a 45 years away from anywhere close to that. <laughs> now, you mentioned uh, Near My Mouth. Um, your breakthrough film from London, to Bright from London to Brighton in 2006, for which you won, I'll have to read this, the New Director's Award at the Edinburgh International Film Festival, Best Feature Film at the Foyle Film Festival, and a jury prize at the Rain Dance Film Festival. Now, the gritty realism that was in London to Brighton, it was so dark, so claustrophobic, but so brilliant. And the, the, the lead girl, Georgia Croom, was, was the cast built around her? How, how did you find her? How, how did you assemble the cast to um, make that film? We had a really sort of great casting director called Tanya Polenta Ruti. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, I'd made a short film about those, um, some of those characters. So I'd already knew that I was going to make it with Johnny Harris and uh, Lorraine Stanley. And 
the rest of the people sort of, you know, we were casting people who had a car. You know, it was literally like it, my mate had the Land Rover. I said, if you let us borrow your Land Rover for free, then you can be in it and you'd be the driver and so and so. And, you know, we just, we, you know, we were just, it was just lucky that we got Georgia. We mm. saw probably, we didn't see a lot of girls because we didn't have any money. Mm. So we couldn't really hold big auditions or anything like that. And everyone worked for free. So I think we were just very lucky that sort of we met Georgia. Mm. And well, were they open auditions or had she... Um, gone through the stages. No, she. Well, I got her from. Well, we got her from the Carlton Workshop uh, in Nottingham, and yeah. basically one connection to another. And we just eventually, you know, yeah. we luckily saw a few girls there, and we saw some girls in various schools, um, and she was just obviously very good. Yeah, she was fantastic, terrific. Um, so the transition from London to Brighton into making your next film was it the success of London to Brighton that enabled you to finance? The cottage, or yeah, I mean, I mean, you could, yeah, it was really. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to get a first film made. Yeah, and we'd been trying to get the cottage made for a long time, um, and we got close at various stages, and we had the bits of development money here, and and then not there, and then uh, once I'd done London to Brighton, you know, you have that thing which doesn't last forever yeah. is you know the buzz or heat or whatever so there was a bit of like you know we'd like to make your next film da, 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 from various people and although I had other ideas mm. actually the cottage was the one that was most developed if you like in terms of where we'd seen mm. locations and actors and so that seemed like it would be the easiest choice to make and also by this point I was absolutely skin mm. so I had no money whatsoever um so the idea of making a film and actually getting paid something was really great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it wasn't like I needed to make a conscious choice of making something very different to London's mm. Brighton. It was, there were lots of factors. And the, the, the horror genre, how, how did all that come about from the, the, the context of, of London to Brighton and the sort of, the, the, the sort of, London gangster, I hate to use London gangster sort of generic yeah. sort of talking terms, but you know, it was very sort of real and gritty. How did it springboard from a film of, of that calibre to. Well, I mean, horror? you know, I think that, you know, there were very different films and obviously very different worlds, and, you know, there were different, there's a different truth to each one, if you like. Mm. So, mm. you know, I just looked at them and try and look at everything as a different entity, a different story, or. Mm. Um, and. You know, so I was very. It, I did. I would just completely once London to Brighton had been done. I sort of yeah. disregarded that and 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 was sort of thought this would be really fun and obviously imagined it to be fun. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that was why really basically just it was no real sort of again conscious decision to be like this is just you know, organic my horror process. Fan, just probably, yeah. Also, and it's whatever's next and you can get paid. Sure, sure, sure. And what was it like working with Andy Serkis and Reese Shearsman? I mean, they were great. Um, yeah. You know, really. You know, I still speak to Reese occasionally. Um, really brilliant actors. Yeah, it was yeah. a real, you know, it was, it was a hard shoot. And obviously, at the time, uh, you know, still incredibly green in terms of the industry. So, not really, you know, I was aware I would be in, I would disappoint certain people who'd seen the first film and was mm. expecting something very different to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was still more about the fact, yeah, man, we're making a film. It's really Yeah, good. fantastic. So, so with... <clears throat> song for Marion, unfinished song. You wrote and directed that. So how how did that all? Well, that was my first ever. Uh, that was my first sort of commission. Yeah. If you like, so after London to Bright came off, uh, came out. You know, I had a meeting and I had this brief idea, and I pitched it to David Thompson at the BBC, and he was like, "Okay, well, we'll pay you to write that." And I was like, "Oh wow, wicked." And then obviously I didn't make it because I was I couldn't make it because I was doing various things. We couldn't get certain members of the cast together, yeah. and went forward and then didn't go forward. It was just it was a hard film to get made yeah. uh, until eventually E One at the time picked it up and you know helped us cast yeah. it. And then uh, you know and it was a real interesting experience. It was a different kind of film again because it was obviously a lot more commercial, if you like. Yeah. And did you input? Um, who you wanted for the roles or did a casting director come in read the script and say right okay I've got some fabulous ideas for XYZ I mean there was a bit you know it's always it's always a collaboration between everyone yeah and uh, the bottom line is it's very difficult unless you're you know for one party alone to be 
the one who chooses, mm. it's usually, you know, you're very unlikely to get someone uh, past everyone if everyone else doesn't want that person. Sure. And likewise, if everyone else really wants someone, but I was really possibly against it, then yeah. it would be difficult to get them in. Some fantastic well. actors that were in it. Vanessa Redgrave, Terence Stamp, Gemma Arterton. I mean, again, w was that just a, a, a really fun, enjoyable experience to make? Yeah, I mean, I think everything, everything that I've done has had, you know, a big element of fun to it. It'd have to be, otherwise, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be worth it. But um, you know, there are great actors, and you know, they still wanted to be directed, and they still, you know, there was still a process that was good. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I obviously they are the actors have done uh, amazing jobs mm -hmm. prior to working with me. Who hadn't really done that, you know, yeah, that yeah. much. Um, yeah. <laughs> it sounds an obvious question, but what what is the process from the start to finish? And you, you sort of touched on this earlier, but do you have a sort of um, preconceived idea of how it's going to be from start, middle to end, or does it organically change along the way? And then when it's finished, you think this was really not how I intended it to be at all. Um, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's various drafts of the script that go past, yeah. and you know, then you get this. Then you shoot it, and the uh, parameters of the physical parameters of doing something like a, a film and everything that comes into it. You then change what your the story changes a little bit then, and then when you get into the edit, and you realise actually all these rushes look really great and the scenes are really good, but the story doesn't work. We need to mm -hmm. move things around and do this, you know, try and make it work necessarily in a little bit, uh, different of a way to how we did when when it was written. So there's lots of different stages mm -hmm. where it does develop. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, you can't think ahead. You can only think actually when this is when I do this, it's going to have this, this and this. And then when you do it, you're like, actually, that looks pony. I need to really <laughs> try and do something. Yeah. I need to fix it. Yeah. Um, and that's the way everything's yeah. been. And you mentioned collaboration. Do you work with the same team of people or? Um, I try, you know, yeah. I basically I'm like, if, if we get on, I'm just going to rip my teeth. <laughs> um, if, if we get on yeah. and you know which is I would say hopefully is most of the time and it's good and I think yeah. you'd always try and work yeah. with the same people but I also think it's good to you know see who else yeah. wants to yeah exactly it's a fresh injection isn't it um, so Murder by My Boyfriend which you obviously still, you um, also directed um, starring the wonderful Georgina Campbell who won the BAFTA for Best Leading Actress in 2015 who you were reunited with on Broadchurch. Yeah. How was that again, coming... Working with her... Yeah, um, back after all those years. Oh, the magic was still there, for sure. She's terrific, no, she's, isn't yeah, she? she? You know, um, Georgina's very... She's a good laugh, she's very funny. Yeah. Um, you know, I got on with her, and, yeah, I thought we'd... You know, again, it was that whole situation of... With Murder by My Boyfriend, not necessarily knowing that it would have the effect that it did, you know, when it yeah. went out, and... Obviously, it was it did sort of very well and raised a lot of issues, and mm -hmm. you know that was one of the reasons why you make it. Yeah. But obviously, you know when you make something that's slightly under the radar, and then it's good, or it's you know it exceeds what people's expectations are. It's yeah. even more of a like, oh my god, look what's been made. Yeah. And you went on to make a, a, another film about domestic violence. And but it was a short. It was basically a a, it was a very small um, thing for Women's Aid. Yeah. Um, just a, I don't know what you call public service yeah, video, I don't yeah. know what you, what you might call them, yeah. an awareness film. Sure, yeah. Um, I was very lucky that they asked me, and you know, and I, again, working with Amory Duff and Phil Davis and, Terrific, yeah. uh, and Chesapeake James, you know, really great people to work with, so I was yeah. very fortunate. Now, I must, going back to Broadchurch, talk about it, because it's captured the imagination of, you know, um, the UK public and beyond. Um, series three, uh, you've directed the first three or three episodes yeah. of this series, and then you pick it up again, the penultimate and eighth, the final episode. Yeah. So obviously you know how it ends, we're not going to reveal anything to anyone, but is there still this MI5 secrecy? Do the actors know who the, who the killer is? Because I think, was it the first series? Not even the actors knew. No, they didn't know. And, and the thing is, when I sort of said yes to the job, I was like, you know, we have to... I don't want to not keep. I don't want to keep it a secret. I think the actors need to know. I'd like the actors yeah. to know who's involved. So I remember we, you know, we spoke about that, and that was great. And sort of, you know, people 
got to know what was what and um I see me, I'm really careful of what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, you know, so that was very important to me. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like, it, obviously it's very secret because the show is a very big show. Mm. And whereas I think actually it would be a shame if people had the information sure. early because it just spoils it. Yeah. Um, but you can imagine yeah. some yeah. absolute rubbish paper. <laughs> Desperate to yeah, reveal who, who we, know, we know who they are. But it happens all the time, like Line of Duty, Broadchurch, any of these real cliffhanger dramas. They have the spoilers, like the following day they have a breakdown and you just kind of think... It kind of demystifies the whole experience and joy of watching something and... I think it's because we live in a, an age where everything's available very yeah. quickly. Yeah. So, you know, no sooner is it out there than it's suddenly, you know, it's written about, it's blogged about, it's, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff. And... You know, it's very, even it's very difficult to not find things out unless you have like a complete technical shutdown yeah. of everything. Absolutely. Um, and you directed um, an episode of Wallander too. What was? No, it? I didn't know I was in Wallander. You were in Wallander. I was in an oh of my Wallander. goodness! I mean, what I would was... love to have done one of them, but no. Basically, after I'd the last sort of acting thing I did, was, yeah, um, I was fortunate enough to be in Wallander. And and how much had you done? What what was? Well, I hadn't acted for ages. And right, so how did that come about? Um, I sort of joined, so I sort of got an agent more out of a favour to me, you know, yeah. um, someone took me on. And the, my, the casting director who I knew ages and ages and ages. Doreen, ago, Doreen, Doreen yeah, yeah. She was yeah. like, does Paul want to come in for this? And usually people don't want to see you because you're a director as well. Yeah. And Charles uh, Martin, who was the director was very much like yeah okay and I was like you know it was only a small spit of cough man, yeah. but you know it was uh, a bit of money and you know worked with you know great people mm -hmm. trip to uh, Sweden yeah fantastic it was very good um, so I'm sure we've touched on this earlier but what have you seen recently that has impressed inspired you on, on TV of late anything that you think Fantastic, this is where, you know, more of this, please. This is where, you know, we should sort of be going with, with, well, with think, TV you know, drama. I, I think that, Amer you know, America do some really great stuff. And I think, mm -hmm. actually, I'm kind of hooked on Line of Duty at the minute. Mm. Um, I think America does, you know, Netflix and stuff where yeah. you're a bit more open to yeah, be yeah. Um, either more risky or more challenging subjects. I think... Um, so I really, I, I really like Narcos very much, mm -hmm. um, and the show at the moment I really think is amazing is Big Little Lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, why, why do you think it is that American TV has far outstripped cinema in terms of fantastic ideas, scripts, you know, drawing big, big actors where you know you would only ever see them, you know, in in picture houses. Well, I think that the de it's, it's you know cinema is very films are very difficult to get made, mm. and um, you know TV once it's commissioned and it's there, it's happening, it's done, and so you know it's going to happen. And mm. I think it, there possibly was a bit of a divide between someone who was doing film and, and someone doing TV a while ago. And since Amazon and, and Netflix mm -hmm. um, have come about, and the sort of budgets have been bigger and the stories have been bigger. That I think there's no um, no wall at all now. Mm, I think it just mm. flipped between yeah. both. But I think as it's much more difficult to get a film made, um, I think TV can really bring uh, actors because there's a lot of great projects yeah. out there and a lot of great <clears throat> parts. And you have the chance to really explore not only character but the storyline with all the episodes and series that you can go on to develop with. No, hundred percent. I mean, you know, an act. You know, when you've got ninety minutes, you can mm, do so mm -hmm. much. And when you've got longer, yeah. then obviously you can do a lot more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, TV is a big mm. thing now. Um, directors seem to be the most invisible of the industry in terms of, you know, everyone sort of talks a lot about the agents and the casting directors being the, the gatekeepers. Um, how or do performers contact you if they want to... Drop you a, a <laughs> drop me. Um, drop you there. The CV. thing is, you know, you get contacted on like social media, yeah, by people and with show reels and uh, and I'm not I'm not against that. I know some people get really frustrated at being 
someone tried to get in touch with me and I'm like you know that doesn't bother yeah, me at all yeah. um, you know every now and again someone got my email address and I'm like man you know kudos <laughs> you know you managed to find it and, yeah. um, so I, it, you know when I was starting out I certainly did, tried to uh, you know sort yeah. of get my way in any way possible you've got to hustle like. haven't you you have got to hustle and I think I always think hustling's not is okay if the if what you've got to hustle with yeah is uh, of a certain quality. Yeah. So, you know, I really sort of hassled people and I wanted, you know, when I was starting out being a director. Um, and sort of, it's it's just always that fine line between being a pain in the ass. And yeah, yeah. So it's hustle, not hassle. Hustle, not hassle, <laughs> that's what I do. Um, what do you look for, or, or what qualities you admire in, in, in particular actors where you see them and is it an instinctive thing or do you think I would love to work with either him or her um i guess it's an instinctive thing i think that it's what i find is is auditions can sometimes be misleading mm. because you know it's a very different situation yeah. to uh to sort of see somebody mm. at their mm. best or their worst or whatever i actually much prefer you know seeing if we get on yeah and and if we get on, then I'm like, well, if you, you know, if you're in the room, then you can't be horrendous. So then, you know, what can we, mm. what can we, what can we do with that? But I'm not, to be honest, it's, I, I don't. CVs, I only really look at to see if they've worked with anyone I know. Yeah, yeah. But course. for you know, it's always about how you get on in the room, and mm. if you know, and you, I would say auditions are, having done them on both sides, mm. they are very tough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think actors. You know, the, it's a really tough gig, I think. Absolutely. On the audition process, when we, as I've sort of said before, um, talking to, to our audience today, we, we had our international casting panel, and one casting director, who Tessa Lander, who, who's Swedish, she has an hour and a half with her actors. One actor is, at a time. At a time, which is a huge sort of workshop. Uh, Natalie Sharon said she had uh, 45 minutes with them in the room. And Maureen Hughes said, 15 minutes. How, how long do you do you have in, in the audition? Um, I guess it just varies. Well, I think it should... Uh, what I, it's difficult, isn't it? Because what really it should be... Because the thing is, if you get if you, got, if you want an hour and a half for someone and they come in and they're rubbish, or not right... <laughs> Where's the eject button? What are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to have an hour and a half of bump, you know, doing yeah. nothing. And yeah. I think yeah. that... So... I think... You know, I mean, I've seen people when you get 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, but there are times when I've been like, I wish I had more time. Yeah. And there are other times where you're like, oh my God, you know, please don't read that again. Um, yeah. So it's, you can never tell. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, what I do like is I like workshops and the thing we're doing at the moment, you know, we did some um, open casting from schools and stuff in mm. Manchester and it was just what we just did improv. Yeah, yeah. What, what's like it like casting children? Was it children? Uh, teenagers. Teenagers. What's it, what's it like just going into the schools on, on a sort of open casting? It was good. We just, you know, they all come in, they're all, um, they're all loud because everyone's loud in auditions and, yeah, you know, trying yeah. to, you know, and you can spot, and often it's like spotting someone who doesn't feel the need to be like, hey, look at me. And that's yeah. actually trying to sort of do something. But, it, you know, we, we cast a kid in this, in this new, in the new thing we did, um, BBC thing, and he was, He'd only been in Bugsy Malone wow. at school, and he's actually very good. And, yeah, it know, must be a, a, dif a, a difficult thing. With it's a bit very, when you see a good child actor, it's it's not unusual, but when when you see someone who's so natural, who is so young, I mean, in this case, you know, you're talking a little bit older, but it's it's a difficult skill, isn't it, for for young actors? I think who maybe haven't had any training, and you know, are just delivering the lines, or or do you think there's more of a sort of pure truth? With, with I think, those, I mean, you'd hope there'd be a, 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 a um, like a pure truth, really. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the thing is, you don't want to see it. I mean, you don't want to see acting. You don't anyone, anyone acting. Um, yeah. And if you see it with um, with young children, actually, I'm not, not that. We had a, one young girl in this, and she she was very sweet. And also, you know, the hours. It's really complicated trying to find someone who can, you know, be natural, listen to what you're trying to say, yeah. but. Um, you know, just loads yeah. of people out there. We've had a, a couple of questions <clears throat> come through. Uh, this one from Casey Lloyd. Paul, best places to fund a short film. I've just written a new script and it needs funding. 
<laughs> uh, back pocket. Um, basically, I, you know, it's a long time since I made a short film, but every mm. short film I've ever made, I've never had funding from anything other than a couple of quid here and there, mm. parents, friends. I mean, my girlfriend funded her short film, which went on to win the BAFTA last year wow. by Kickstarter. So, you know, that's a good way of doing it, I guess, because she raised seven grand, I think, uh, for hers. Um, so, yeah, I think that try and get as much as you can for nothing and try and get money from wherever you can. Beg favours from Beg friends. Beg favours, because, you, no you know, you might get money from a group, from some, uh, I don't know, fund, whether it's a local fund or a, um, a regional thing. But then again, with that comes a lot of it. It takes ages. It yeah. takes... Yeah, you've got to go yeah, for yeah, development yeah. forever and it's like depending on how sort of manageable the script is it just to go in how does it normally take the process from, from start? I mean I don't suppose there's any sort of template but how long from the sort of idea of it and then what for a short film well and, and, a, and a well a feature film a feature. ever <laughs> um, and a short film depending on how much you need and what the logistics of it mm. can take any amount of time but I always think it's very good to just uh, if you're making a short film especially and if I'm with Lance of we did it, um, where we, you set a date, yeah, and you go, right, we're going to make it on that date, whether we've got 50p or, you mm -hmm. know. And how long did, did Land Under Brighton? To get that made from writing it to sort of shooting it, it was probably six months. Wow, okay. So. That's not too bad, although. Yeah, it was made for 60, you know, it was made for not very money. <laughs> but, but I would have made it, you know, we, we sort of really would have made it with whatever we had, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Another question, this one from Callum Taylor. Um, what would be your top three rules or expectations for actors on set? Turns ons, turns offs from actors. Um, I would say treat every job like it's your first and you're very grateful to be there. Um, so that. Mm. Remember, you are, if you are getting paid, you're in a very fortunate position. And there are shitter jobs out there. Mm, mm. Um, and don't be be nice to everyone. Yeah. Don't be rude because that's one thing I really hate. Yeah. Is rude behaviour, rude to runners, rude to anyone in the crew just for the sake of being rude. Everyone's, you know, everyone's there for a reason. Everyone's tired. Everyone's working mm -hmm. hard. And the last thing you need is an actor moaning Being about something when actually come on, dude. Yeah. You know. It goes back to what you're saying about collaboration you know you should all be you know in it you're in it together aren't you so there's there's no real room to, to really be muddy or yeah. rude or I guess you know if you if you are on set you know waiting around for, for many hours but as you say you know it's, it's a privilege to do the job when you get the gigs because you know they are few and far between for, for jobbing actors I mean to, the thing is it's, it. it's an everyone's natural uh go-to is to moan mm. I moan all yeah. the time we all moan we're all you know spend ages trying to get a job you get the job and you're like ugh can't believe I've got to get picked up now. <laughs> you know, in this car, you yeah. learn about the food when you get, yeah. you know, and realistically, you get three meals a day on, on a, you know, on a, a sort of regular job. You get three meals, which you don't get in any other profession. Mm. You know, you might have to sit in your trailer or on the dining bus or whatever. But if you were working at Tesco or somewhere, and they said, actually, you can just go and sit in the staff room for a, for the next eight hours, you'd be like, great. You know, so we take up we, we're. We take a lot for granted, and mm. I think actors and anyone in this industry really, you know, we're fortunate to be doing it. So, yeah. moan, you know, there's little gripes and there's just being silly. Yeah, yeah, getting on with it. <clears throat> Another question, this one from Stephanie Swan. Um, when creating a script, do you just have an idea and run with it, or see where it goes, or see where it goes, or do you rather gather inspiration first, consider what the public are watching already? Oh God. Um, so, no, I never consider the public. Right, yeah. <laughs> which okay. uh, could be why, you know, I'm not a multimillionaire. But um, <laughs> no, I think that I tend to have an idea and start on page one mm. and see where it goes. I'm not one, I'm not very good at planning it all the way through and I loathe research. Mm. Um, I think if it wasn't for Wikipedia, I probably wouldn't have written very much at all. Um, I'm, so I'm not a big fan of research. Basically, I will write and then yeah. keep going till the end and then go back and fix it all. Yeah, yeah. Another question uh, from Lisa Armitage. 
What was your rehearsal process during the three episodes of Broadchurch? Um, and what exposure to police rape support unit did Judy have? Um, well, the rehearsal for it, not a lot. Mm. Um, you know, we'd rehearse the scene before we did it. Yeah. And, you know, we'd talk about stuff. And But I think in terms of actual physical rehearsal, there just wasn't very much at all. Um, which is just the nature of yeah. filming. And, you know, we were very lucky to have the support of... Um, uh, Dorset, there was a, a rape crisis centre um, and so we had lots of people that one Julie went to meet um, and there was completely on hand I think Chris when he was writing it sort of got everything factual and uh, all the information and research had done you know a year before he started I think he you know I think to his credit he made a you know he sort of really made sure everything was yeah. set up there for Julie to go in and find out everything necessary to help her, you know, play that mm, part. Mm. Um, so yeah, there was, it, it, we were in touch all the whole way. Yeah, I, I thought it was very sensitively approached and I love the scene even when she goes in to um, get swabbed and, and, and when Olivia Coleman, you know, you know, we need to get this done for you to have your cup of tea. Just little detailed bits, which was so sensitively approached I, 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 and, and acted. It, it was just, it was classy stuff, I have to say, and it is such a, a big and difficult subject matter. I thought it was very well handled by everyone. No, I think uh, I agree with you, and I think um, <clears throat> that was always going to be the intention because it's one of those, you know, you have to do the seriousness of it justice. Mm. And I think you also have to make it as real as possible, and, some of the, and what makes it real are, is the, the, are the little details yeah. of... You know, this is so you can have a cup of tea, or you know, this is what you're standing on. Mm. Those are the things that put you in the actual place, rather than the big. You know, there's room for that, obviously, but mm. rather than the big emotive yeah. stuff, it's actually you know, this is going to help us understand that this is where you know, this is a mm. real place, and these are the real things that people do. Yeah, yeah. Judy's fantastic in it. Really, really good. Um, another question from Pin Lee: Do you think it's harder for an actor to find a new job than it is for a director? Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, as a director, it's much easier for me to generate my own work. Mm. Um, so if I'm not getting anything, you know, I can grab a camera, I can go do stuff, I can write stuff, I can really try and push and push and push. Mm -hmm. Whereas for um, an actor, I think it's really hard. And I think if I was, a, you know, if I was going back to being an actor now, I would set up a theatre company or I would do something that yeah. would en enable me to do stuff because you know there's a lot of waiting by the phone and I think and there's just so many actors out there mm. and it's now different you can't you know get in touch with a casting director is nigh on impossible mm. you know when before the internet when I started I used to be able to send a card or do something yeah. and now you just I would say most of the time a spam yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're in the junk folder and yeah. I think that's really really difficult um, I really think the best thing to do is do as much as you can whenever you can in the hope that you will either get seen you might meet someone who next year is like actually I'm doing this other thing I don't really want you to do it I'm getting paid and yeah. you know just always keep a lookout yeah, yeah. but I think it's much harder for for actors to I, get I think it's up. it's difficult to, to, to be positive and proactive you know in those sort of down times of which every actor is going to have not but every it, actor <laughs> well not every actor but for the, the majority <clears throat> Of, of course, of most jobbing it's, actors. It's you know, I think it's one of the most depressing. You know, you're you're you, if you're an actor, there's a good chance you're someone who might need the, uh, you know, other people. What's the right word? Not approval, um, but need the sort of uh, the sort of validation yeah. by being in an industry where people go, give you a job that you're very mm -hmm. good, so and so. So to not have that. I think is an incredibly um, painful type thing, mm. and you know you're basically you know people come in and audition for for me, and uh, and you're like, I really want to give it you, but you're just not right. You know, mm. I can see quite clearly you're a fantastic actor, but I cannot. You know, you're yeah, just not right yeah. for this role, and it's you know, so you're not even getting. You know, you get people are looking at your picture, going, no, not him, not him, not her, not her. I mean, it's a really odd world. Mm, brutal, harsh. 
You know. um, would you ever consider maybe directing theatre? Is that ever? No, I did a play. I did a play at the Trafalgar Studios um, a year and a half ago, and uh, with Anthony Head and Neve Cusack and uh, Tom Hughes and uh, and David Michaels, and, and you know, got five stars in the yeah. Times. It did really well. It yeah. sold out, but unfortunately, it was in the, the studio below and you you know even if we filled it out which we yeah. did we just made no money so it's you know it was possible to survive mm, if you mm. by doing that yeah um it's a different thing as well because you can't stop it yeah halfway through and go i don't like can you do that line again yeah yeah, yeah. whereas obviously with film and tv if it's not right you can go again yeah, yeah. but if on stage you just have to suck it up yeah um but yeah it's a really you know again just working with actors and Having a really, you know, having a nice time, having a nice rehearsal, yeah. and make sure everyone sort of feels as as possible. Mm-hmm. An enjoyable process, then. Well, no, it's, I think everything's, you know, you don't go to work, you know. I think it should always be an enjoyable process. Mm. Obviously, any job, whether it's TV, film, whatever, it's always stressful. It's always going to be, you know, fighting time, fighting light, fighting money, everything. And I think, you know, is to try and sort of establish a team. Uh, what's the word energy of everyone mm. trying to be positive and having a laugh being able to fail be, being able to make any mistakes and not be punished you know I think that's you know really yeah, important yeah going back to actors and how you audition people is it largely self tapes or do you prefer them in the in the audition room um, I think if you well the thing is if you get a tape you've always got to see them anyway yeah unless it's like impossible yeah um so, you know, there's been a couple of times where we've cast people on, from a tape. Um, but then, uh, you know, I do think actually getting face-to-face and speaking to someone mm-hmm. is, is, is very important. But I actually, you know, it doesn't matter. You can write a letter if it's good. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind how, it doesn't really matter how you, you sort of see someone and get them in. I think it's just all about whether they can do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think doing a self-tape when you've got no one there to go, actually try it again. And this time maybe do this and this. Mm-hmm. So you're literally going off your own steam. Yeah. And sometimes that can really work. And then sometimes you're like, dude, you are so way off <laughs> with, uh, with, the, with what you're doing. And that yeah. can be kind of, um, you know, so then you feel like I've gone to all that effort doing stuff. And you're just like... Any tips for, for what makes a good self-tape or showreel? Do you... Do you... Do you, do you sort of cast from showreels much or is it more about... No, I mean, I, you know, I'll see a showreel and yeah. often you see a showreel before you then go out to somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I mean, the tips are just don't overact. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, you know, almost every audition that ever happens, you have to go, okay, bring it down, do mm-hmm. it again, mm-hmm. make it a bit smaller and match nerves and everything like that. I mean, however, I auditioned for something the other day um, via you know casting director I know mm. and I my girlfriend taped me doing it mm. and it was excruciating I hated it so much and it, it you know clearly I would never have been able to do it because it probably took about 25 goes before <laughs> I got anything worth sending out and it was it was awful why? why was it awful? Yeah. because you're just a harsh critic I'm quite yeah, harsh yeah. I'm watching it go God, I, I really am the worst actor in the history of the world. You know, it's bad light, bad sound, everything's yeah, just looks yeah, horrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it sort of made me think about how good actors yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. What um, projects for the future, or do you sort of not want to talk about it in case you jinx anything? Well, no, I mean, I've got, you know, I'm sort of, I'm finishing this thing, which is the new, you know, Murdered by My Boyfriend, and then last year there was Murdered by My Father, mm-hmm. and now um, there is... We're doing another, we've just shot the other one, a new one. Um, and it was good because obviously going back from Broadchurch, which was mm. uh, a big sort of tentpole show, if you like, um, to something really small. And, you know, it was a really good good thing for me yeah. to do. Um, and, yeah, I've got something that starts later in the year that's going to be quite big. I can't really say anything, but it's, like, it's a, big, a big gig. Brilliant. Um, another couple of questions have come through, Lisa Armitage. Um, are unrepresented actors ever considered for TV drama? Um, if I'm absolutely honest, no. Mm. 
Uh, or it's, it's incredibly difficult. The only way you're going to get seen if you're unrepresented is, it, from my experience, it's not like my ultimate knowledge, is by knowing me, <laughs> mm. um, or no, you know, knowing the director, yeah. knowing the cast and director personally, mm-hmm. or getting in touch, you know, sort of privately, and just getting someone on a day where they're like, oh my God, yeah, all right, you know, whatever. It's really hard, and that's you know that sucks that that is the way it is. Um, but yeah, it's just really yeah. tough because the thing is, is a casting director, you know, they'll they'll come to me with names, yeah, yeah. unless there's people I particularly want to see. So obviously, I'll give it my suggestions for a part. So it's casting director who gets mm-hmm. the sort of the initial, you know, flood mm. of. Flood Wait, of when you left drama school, did you did you sign straight away with an agent? I signed. Did you? I was. The, I signed in the summer before because yeah. I was in the National Youth Theatre. You know, it was weird because I signed with someone who was quite big, actually. Mm. And then, fortunately, or unfortunately, I got a lot of people wanted to sign me afterwards. Yeah. And uh, I was already signed with someone. And, you know, I worked, did good jobs. and um, But then, obviously, you know, in hindsight, I may have gone with someone else who I've now met and like a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Um, however... Life goes the way it goes, yeah. doesn't it? So yeah. if I, you know, I could be doing some terrible tour and not being a director. Yeah, so. yeah. no, quite. Um, another question from Pinley, brackets, again. Uh, where do you think actors from ethnic minorities stand in the UK? Would you say there are more opportunities nowadays? Um, I mean, I'd say, yeah, because there's more stuff being made. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's, there's just that fact. I think that still is so long, it's such a long way to go. But that's just for the perception of everyone, even for people, uh, you know, for someone from an ethnic background playing someone who's not written from an ethnic background. Does that make sense? Mm. And that just takes everyone from directors, casting directors, mm. to just open their mind a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult, obviously, not. Being someone from uh, sort of an ethnic background that may find it difficult yeah. to work in this industry, it's that I don't know. Yeah, you know? It, it does feel a very painfully slow process because if it is to reflect, you know, the community in, in, and the world that we live in, oh, it's, it's it's so it's it is still very sort of. I think when we stop looking at people and going, okay, well, this part is for a, a black guy. Yeah. This part is for a Chinese woman, mm. and. You know, if it's not specifically a Chinese character, then why shouldn't that Chinese yeah. woman be able to play? I think it's slowly changing, very, very slowly changing. I think TV, when, when you see, for example, Line of Duty and, and many, many dramas, it is getting better, but it is very slow, it feels. Of course it is. We're still, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, stereotyping all yeah. over the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question, this time from Barney Cooper. Paul, do you think that actors trying to be- break into the industry need to be living in London? Will they miss opportunities by being based elsewhere? Uh, it depends where you're based. You know, if you're based in the Outer Hebrides, yeah. you've got a chance, um, you know, or very little chance. If you're yeah. based in a big city, Manchester or Liverpool, um, then obviously there are going to be scenes, you know, um, ways to go and do acting be an actor Um, whereas I think obviously in London there is a wider network of people and opportunities Um, I think unless you're if you're you have to be somewhere where there's stuff going on I think if you're somewhere remote it's going to be very difficult but um, you know you can be remote once you've made loads of money and everyone knows who you are because then you can, then yeah, you can, you can do be that. Greta Garbo then, but Manchester, Scotland. Well, just I think if you're hubs. in a big, yeah, if you've got yeah. a hub, that's great. Yeah, but yeah. I think if you're, you know, if you're in a small town, unless people come looking for you there, then yeah. I think that's really hard. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I was from, I was in a small seaside town, and I wanted to be an actor. Luckily, I got into the National Youth Theatre. Mm. But if I hadn't heard about, it was only then that I heard there was such a thing as drama schools. Yeah. And if yeah. I hadn't heard that, then. God knows where I'd be right now. Initially, what what gave you the the acting bug, as it were? God, I was with a, um, I, was a, I was twelve, and I was with I was having a fight with a guy, and he had to stop the fight because he had to go to rehearsals, 
And then he said, do you want to come? And I was like, okay. So I went to the rehearsals with him and I saw they were doing this play. And I was like, oh man, yeah, this would be it. And then eventually just auditioned for something. Mm. You know, it was in Timmouth and the old, an old theatre there and it was, you know, the amateur dramatic side of it. So I took all that doing that. Mm. And it was just, you know, drama was the only thing I really sort of focused on. So it was my teachers really, that yeah. my drama teacher and my English teacher. Who coming to my wedding? You know, we're still, you know, still speaking. Yeah, yeah. I think without them, I probably don't yeah. know what I've been doing. I hate it's, to think. No, it's it's great to a to be encouraged, of course, but to feel that you have that mentorship, which I think is kind of missing from from young actors on leaving drama school, and you know, getting out into the big old scary world of the industry. Well, I think you know what's good is just to have someone go, mate. It's okay to be having this mm. the fact that you're not doing this these are all feelings that it's alright I, I think to the difficult thing about drama school is that you spend three years doing something every day being a part of an acting world mm. and doing plays and different parts great camaraderie everyone's having a great laugh pubs at night da, da, da. and then you come out into big wide world and suddenly oh man I've got a job what am I going to do so you're not faced with reading scripts and yeah. doing and I think that's where, for a lot of people, you suddenly go, oh my God, what the, how am I going to do this? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a really tough thing Yeah, to do. yeah. I, I think I certainly felt that coming out of drama school. It's exactly what you're saying. You know, you're casting plays, certainly for the final year of your of your training, the first two, you're, you're doing all those fantastic, you know, workshops, animal studies, etc. And then once you're out, certainly if you haven't, like me, signed with an agent, yeah. or, you know, you're really clued up about casting directors, who to approach professional etiquette I think it's really tough isn't it yeah, it's a for, for young actors I mean um, yeah it's an absolute nightmare and the thing is at school when they say you know only 2% of you two of this group are yeah. going to be working everyone thinks it's them and uh, unfortunately it isn't <laughs> yeah. you know and it's right because you need to have that sort of confidence or self belief but honestly coming out it's you know, I think it's really hard. Mm, mm. It's great when you work. Yeah, of course. Um, but then it, I gave up because, you know, I was doing jobs that actually was like, hang on, I'm not really, di- I don't need to put much effort into this because it's not really something I would passionately be chasing. Mm. Basically, I'm doing this because one, I've been offered it, or I've, I've got the part, and two, because it's paying. Yeah. And, but it's not like, you know, a role where I'm like, yes, I'm, put so much work and effort into this and lose myself in the character of Bob you know the yeah. and I think that's and that's what made me want to give up mm-hmm. because I yeah. was doing stuff I was getting paid it was you know I did a couple of big jobs but I, you know a smaller role and I was like actually can't just not as, no, no I'm getting nothing from this yeah, yeah. Um, whereas I wanted to be emo- you know challenged emotionally or yeah. creatively and uh, that's one of the things about being a director mm-hmm. that it's more easy because I can generate my own stuff yeah, yeah. You know, but I think for an actor, there are so many parts where you like you get people in and day players and it's like it's great to come and do it and be on set. It's a great environment and stuff. But actually, are you testing yourself? Are you being? I think that's kind of hard. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Um, we have no more questions, um, but thank you so much for being such a fantastic guest for our live stream today, Paul Andrew Williams. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's it now, I'm not on it anymore, am I?